And as we know, it's an open case. We're investigators, right? We're Ed and I are detectives. You are forensic anthropologists. When you have an open case, the the discovery and all of the case folder, the contents therein is not going to be shared with the general public while it's being investigated. And that's yeah. why in this report, it says, you know, the Federal Bureau of Investigation is asking that we, anything pertaining to the medical examiner's investigation of Brian Laundry may not be made public or released until law enforcement completes their investigation. Now, that's not them saying, ha, 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 we're not going to tell you. It's that we are still working on an active investigation. Right. It is still active. And a lot of times this can't really be discussed by the anthropologist uh, and the pathologist until the trial has gone. Again, this is a tough topic to speak about. We brought on the experts to speak about it because um, the users have been sending in so much, so many questions, so much doubt in the process. And, you know, we all talk. The three of us spoke about the professionalism on the forensic side with the police department uh, and then the professionalism once it gets turned over to the, to the laboratory and to the folks who are doing the exam in the exam room. Uh, there is, you know, no, not, no bounds that are, you know, left behind. They don't, there's no stone left unturned is what I'm trying to say. We want to get to an answer. We want to bring justice. We want to bring the perpetrator to justice. We want to bring closure to, or, or a little piece of closure to the families to get to a result of what happened to their loved ones. Um, and, and that's the end goal in all of this, you know? So, um, people have to understand that, that there's not a lot of mean people in, uh, the anthropology, the forensic anthropologist, they, they want to do the same thing that the police want to do. They want to get answers and to get those answers, it takes time and we have to give confidence. We have to give them our support and confidence. Um, we can't just get into that mindset where, Everybody is corrupt and everyone's trying to cover up something. It just gets to be ridiculous after a while. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not putting anybody down because we're all entitled to our opinions. But, you know, we we need to realize that these folks are separate from the investigators that are out searching out in, in, the, in the field. They have a whole complete jo different job and they're professionals and they do it. We don't know uh, exactly w how much remains were brought into the laboratory and brought into the exam room. Um, so everyone is left to just speculate. And some folks talk and, you know, you and I got a good laugh, Doc, the last live stream that we did. Uh, there's uh, people out there thinking that the dentist took um, uh, extracted teeth, gave it to the parents, and they scattered them out like it was dog food uh, and just scattered them out. And col they collected them up and said, oh, look, I got teeth here. Uh, let's pull out some teeth so he can make a getaway to Tijuana. Um, you know, how practical is that in this day and age? And how hard is that to pull something like that off? Yeah, that, you know, that just isn't going to happen. I mean, as far as you know, what's going on as far as that victim is concerned and the decomposition of the remains, you know, and trying to put perpetrators involved um, that go along with the perimortem experience um, or even postmortem things. If someone revisits the scene, all of that's kind of unlikely. Okay. Now, the, the, I look at, I'm looking in the chat and I can see it over and over again. What about the gun? What about the gun? Well, we don't know about the gun. I mean, the gun would be helpful. Doc, you can run with that. It would be helpful. But what we don't know, we don't know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, without a weapon, that's really a tough call. I've been to a lot of scenes where there's been close contact destruction, uh, of particularly the, of the cranium. And, you know, without a weapon, you know, short of a suicide note or some type of, a, you know, a psychiatrist report, this individual was this, this or this. I mean, you can see here where the post-mortem time becomes very crucial. What happened between the time this person disappeared and the time they were recovered, you know, as far as, you know, water, as far as, you know, anything else that could have changed that environment. So there's so many things that have to go into this that really aren't answered. So, I mean, here's the range of possibilities. The gun is still out there somewhere. Law enforcement has the gun. Okay. Those are our possibilities, and we don't know. It's not law enforcement under law enforcement is under no obligation to tell us all the evidence that they have. Okay, right. the, Doc, when you've uh, have when you've examined uh, a skull that had uh, a gunshot wound to it, and it was tight contact, 
have you seen gunshot residues attached uh, in and around the uh, bullet wound entrance, the gunshot wound entrance? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times, of course, it depends on what type of, you know, missiles going in there and, you know, the, uh, the makeup of that, uh, metal quality, again, velocity, all sorts of things like that. But bone, you know, of course, depending upon where it is in the skull, uh, will capture a lot of that. Right. So in, in x-rays, in electron microscopy, all that material can be picked up to understand, again, entry, exit. Right. And I explained to the audience in the past about Lacard's theory of transfer when uh, two objects come in contact with each other and so forth. There's going to be traces of each other's contact of when they separate. What could be some of the other possibilities, Doc? Because I got to just get this out of my head and stop these questions from coming to dutyron.com. What could be some deciding factors of an anthropologist and the team, as you call the team, everyone gets together, right? It's not just the anthropologist, they confer. And What are some of the other possibilities to indicate on skeletal remains that there was a suicide? That's a really tough call. There, there's not much. I mean, other than, you know, the skeletal remains, I mean, it, you know, the breaks that we see as far as homicide are very clear cut, you know, whether that's strangulation or whether that's some kind of, again, some bullet wound or some sharp force trauma to ribs or things like that. You, you know, it's basically a homicide thing. The suicide, that's getting into an entire different area where there has to be some type of a message uh, or a weapon nearby. And right. without that, right. there's also, you know, uh, the placement of the gunshot wound, uh, you know, where is it relative in the skull? And, you know, yeah. I mean, because yeah. obviously most people don't shoot themselves in the back of the head, you know. Um, you exactly. know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, th and there's the other thing, too, if someone's right handed, you know, mm -hmm. to have an entrance wound on the left side of the head, it's just really uncommon. I mean, uh, you know, most wounds, if they're right hand dominant. It's going to be on the right side of the body or something like that, except if it's in the in the chest area. So, you know, getting into getting into the placement of that of that weapon, it's really tough. Yeah. If an anthropologist comes up with cause of death suicide. What could be some of the possibilities of what is indicated? What, in other words, what's in front of the anthropologist that could be clear and concise that could come up with a report like what we see here? And I'm going to add that up onto the screen. Um, when you when you see such details of a report like this, and of course it's not completely detailed, but it goes over six steps, um, and it, they ruled the cause cause of the, the death to be, the manner of death to be uh, suicide. Um, if you could maybe talk on that. Well, there's a lot that goes in with that cause and manner of death. That's primarily the responsibility of the pathologist. Uh, the anthropologist is involved with helping the pathologist up with a mechanism of death or a mechanism of trauma that allows the pathologist to make that call for cause and manner. Uh, things like, um, you know, suicide or homicide. Uh, I mean, when there's a, a gunshot wound to the head, very hard to differentiate based on the skeletal remains alone, which one of those two things took place. I mean, as far as a close, you know, a muzzle blast um, and the proximity to the bone, a lot of things can go into the reconstruction that's going to help that anthropologist and ultimately the pathologist make an understanding about whether that was suicide uh, or homicide. Again, the completeness of the remains are crucial uh, to come up with some of those answers. On the report itself, it said that the, anth the anthropologist had did some reconstruction. Uh, so could you explain what, you know, what the various types of forensic anthropology reconstruction um, that could have occurred here? Primarily what that uh, forensic anthropologist was up to was trying to reconstruct uh, the skull or the postcranium, any type, any region of the body where there's breaks, things that are suspicious, things that wouldn't go along with uh, a normal decomposition uh, event. And so again, since bone keeps a memory of that trauma, uh, what takes place is that you have this anthropologist that is piecing together things to try to understand what the perimortem or around the time of death story is. Because that's what the forensic pathologist and anthropologist do is tell a story about what happened. And so when we have reconstruction, again, primarily for blunt force and ballistic force, 
there can be a lot of damage to that bone. And it takes some pretty meticulous work to get that back together so that you can understand the dynamic of trauma that took place. Okay, so, so depending on the uh, ballistic damage that occurs to a skull, this, it could be as simple as a hole, a, a gunshot hole, entrance, and then uh, entrance into the cavity, or that ballistic damage could have fractured this skull into many pieces. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, again, it's based on the, it's based on the caliber. It's based on the directionality. It's based on the, um, the proximity uh, mm -hmm. of the firearm or, or the, the bullet actually to the, uh, to that surface. Yeah. And so all those things weigh into the fact that just like you said, it could be a single hole, uh, even a single exit hole uh, or complete reduction of the skull. Right. And given the uh, decomp, potential scattering, the critters may have gotten to um, uh, the skull and the and so forth. Um, there could be pieces of the skull that are scattered all over the place and they would have to be as much of it found as possible. And then once that's found, you would then go to work on it back at the laboratory, like putting a puzzle yeah. together? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a jigsaw puzzle. And again, the autopsy that the forensic pathologists and anthropologists do together starts at the crime scene. Mm -hmm. So if the recovery is poor, the reconstruction and the result are going to be poor. If the recovery yeah. is by an anthropologist uh, or by um, good crime scene personnel, I mean, that's everything. Again, the autopsy starts there. And so right. the reconstruction is only as good as the remains that are recovered.